Muktesh, uh, uh, you know, is going to be talking about excellence uh, with the new normal future of work, leadership, and the role of technology. Uh, you know, he's a seasoned customer success uh, and IT engineer leader with a 17 plus years uh, track record of consistently building and growing a uh, successful software business with a focus in the B2B enterprise and marketing technology spaces. Uh, last five years in Acquia, uh, currently he's the country head of Acquia in India. So uh, I'd like Muktesh to take on uh, the baton now and the mic technically and uh, you know, start off with the talk. Sure. Um, thank you, Parth. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope all of you are in good health. Uh, uh, Parth did talk about me, uh, so I wouldn't dwell on the introduction uh, much. I am the country head for Acquia in India, um, an engineer at heart, um, and have uh, have uh, had the opportunity to know Drupal community in India uh, closely uh, over the last uh, five years, to say the least. But today, what I'm talking about is is <clears throat> kind of a little distanced uh, from just the Drupal view of the world, but it's something that is very real to all of us at this point in time, right? Uh, so what I want to talk about, as uh, Parth alluded to, is about uh, excellence with this new normal, right? And we, we'll talk about you know what it means for the future of work. We'll talk about some leadership aspect and nuances, and perhaps I'll allude to what technology aspects does it touch upon, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> So I want to start with uh, this notion of uh, a black swan event, right? Um, now, let, let me give you some background there. In 2007, there is a very famous author. His name is uh, Nassim Nicholas Talib. Uh, he wrote this book, uh, I think it was 2007, uh, The Black Swan. Um, he is a mathematician. He is also an options. He was an options trader in the Wall Street. And the black swan event, the theory of black swan uh, events is really about events which are unprecedented, uh, very rare, and they have severe impacts, right, for, for the time after that particular event, right? We indeed are living through one such uh, moment, one such event uh, in 2020. I'm sure you must have uh, witnessed it for yourself that this is the biggest black swan event um, at least in my recollection, um, and I'm, I'm not a very young guy. Uh, so this is, we're living through this uh, black swan event, right? Now, when, when we are living through this, then it does change some dimensions of um, what the new normal is. And we are not still, I'm, I'm in no way suggesting that uh, we are in normalcy by any stretch of imagination. Uh, but the new normal uh, which is unfolding right before our eyes is very different from whatever we know, right? Uh, whatever we have known for uh, for our lifetimes, um, and th there are a few things that that jump out in terms of this new normal, right? And again, we are still kind of scratching the surface. We don't know what we don't know. Um, so one is one thing. If you, if if I could indulge you, the the one of the bigger patterns that emerged is that this there was a big online big bang that happened, right? So everybody had to had to go online. Not a choice. I'm sorry, was there a question or something? Okay. No, no. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So, Path, could you help me keep it on mute unless there is a question? Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the first uh, big uh, trend that emerges, right? So, and, and you will see it around you. I mean, you, I don't have to tell you this. I mean, there are people I know, and I'm sure you know, um, who who like the the conventional way they deal with things, whether it's buying groceries or um, doing the way they do things, the way they operate. Everything has been turned on its head and this has happened by brute force so this big bang now big bang always is not always great um, and i'll talk more about that what it means and how kind of the world uh, delivered um, at, around this event of this big bang the online big bang uh, the other big trend that kind of jumps at you uh, out at you uh, is this uh, 
this notion uh, that a consultant and author, his name is John Husband, he coined, the, he calls it the virarchy, like a hierarchy, but a virarchy, right? The idea behind the virarchy is that you build relationships. Um, and imagine, when I say that, imagine the connections you have on platforms like LinkedIn and so forth, where your connections are based on trust, your knowledge, and the information flows based on those aspects, right? Uh, it's not based on hierarchy. It's not based on conventional ways the information flows. And if you now you juxtapose it to what is happening around us, the whole work from home, remote working, offices, uh, you know, kind of offices, home, all kind of merged um, all together. Your, your home is your new, new castle, if you will. Uh, so this whole concept of uh, hierarchy, if you will, uh, will make a lot of uh, a lot, lot of sense, right? Where the connections are based on knowledge, skills, abilities, trust, so on and so forth, and that's how people work together. Some of us within this uh, Drupal India Association uh, participating companies is what I'm referring to do a very good job in terms of working very well in this hierarchy model in a very distributed setting, right? So that's the other big trend that jumps out in terms of this new normal. The third thing which I'll mention before I switch gears, the third thing that jumps out is this whole idea about uh, cleanliness, hygiene, right? Now, I'll, I'll give you, an, give you uh, an anecdotal point there, right? So when 9-11 happened, which, by the way, was a black swan event because that didn't just change terrorism travel, that changed Wall Street, that changed businesses, everything, right? So right after 9-11, uh, TSA uh, was formed, uh, which I think is some transportation support uh, assistance program or something like that, right? Which is really when you go to US, they kind of check you and all that. That's their responsibility, right? So uh, one, of the, one of the things that you hear about that they will, the same thing will happen around healthcare now, right? So if you're carrying something like an infectious disease or virus, then there'll be some kind of a healthcare uh, program, like an HSA, if you will, right? Uh, look at how you now interact with people. I mean, human beings by design, uh, and I love uh, how kind of uh, Rahul talked about the historicity of India and all that. But by design, human beings uh, live in communities. That's how we thrive, right? We, we like to be physically uh, with one another. Uh, there, there are so many uh, great uh, theories around proximity and the value, the cognitive value of proximity for humans. But all of that is changing now, right? Someone comes, knocks at your door, rings your bell. The first thing you perhaps do it, keep a distance of six feet, right? So all of that is changing. So these are some of these things that are emerging. So the new normal is, is kind of slight, a tad bit different than what any one of us could envision, right? Now, um, if you look at this picture, and so far, I'm still discussing the what of the new normal, right? I'm defining it. I'm, I'm kind of laying those cards out on the table, if you will. Um, th this is this is a uh, uh, this is a recent book uh, released by two economists. This is from this is a reference from that. Uh, is Dr. Baldwin and Dr. Betrys Demaro. They are economists from I think Sweden, uh, and they have uh, rolled out a book. Uh, it's called Economy in um, in around the COVID times or something like that, something to that effect. But what this graph really tells you here is that <clears throat> how uh, this whole Corona situation versus economy, how are they inversely proportional? So if you look at this, uh, if you have containment processes, the blue line, right? If you have those lockdowns like, like we had in India, then uh, you know, this, this peak kind of subdues a little, it goes down, it becomes a little more sober. But then the trough goes further steep down in the, on the economy side. So it's, uh, that is why, you know, we, you know, there are company, there are countries which are opening up, right? So it's inversely proportional, and the inverse is true. If you open it up, then the cases go up. Of course, people interact, people travel from one place to another, but then recession improves, right? The sev severity of that recession improves. So this is a this is a pickle for any 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 country for any any government for us, right? In terms of how this is kind of hand in glove. So this is the what, this is the situation around the new normal. Now let, let me talk about the other dimension of it, that how, how do we get out of that, right? So um, in my limited view of the world, and you guys are much smarter, I have a lot of regard for engineers and I have a lot of respect for Drupal in particular, um, coming from Acquia, 
company run by Dries, uh, who is the founder of Drupal and all. Um, in my limited view, uh, what I what I think is that the way you come out of any situation, any such um, any such uh, moment uh, in your life generally, and this is, as I said, a black swan event, is really two things. It's resilience and sustainability. Now, resilience, now let me take a moment to define resilience. Resilience is this idea when you have a crisis and you can use your strengths, your uh, other positive capabilities to bounce back to a pre-crisis mode as early as possible. That's resilience. And this is, by the way, this, there is a resilience theory. That's what the, the definition, that's where the resilience definition comes from. Um, resilience, interestingly, is something that is very personal, very individual. So while we talk about businesses having the resilience and now, you know, XYZ business has bounced back and it's working and so on and so forth. Uh, it somewhere hinges on individuals, right? And as I said, uh, that uh, for individuals, it it hinges on your uh, your personal beliefs, your personal traits, your personal strengths. So if something happens to you, something which is like a really, really bad situation, which hits you hard, like Corona has hit us hard, but many things happen, like life has all sorts of events. Uh, what you do is you focus on, uh, on uh, your strengths, on your, on your capabilities, which are positive about your individual personality. And um, you, this is what therapists do. I was telling this to someone in my team a couple of days ago. Um, in psychology, there is this uh, uh, notion of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, right? Within CBT, there is a model called the ABC model, right? Uh, so when people are suicidal or people get anxious or uh, you know they have stress of some sort, which many of us have, at this point in time, uh, being locked uh, within our homes. Uh, so ABC model really is that activating event. What is the activating event? B is the belief. What is the belief you have around the activating event? And C is the consequence. The gist of that is it's not the activating event that's very powerful. It's actually your belief, right? So what I mean by that is resilience can be learned if you, if you develop your belief if you develop a belief system, which is on the positive side, which focuses on your strengths, which looks at the glass half full and which looks at the light at the end of the tunnel, right? That's resilience. We'll come to sustainability in a moment. And because I wanted to keep it light and uh, I wanted to take an example of resilience, uh, I'm sure many of you here must have seen this movie 300. I assume uh, you must have. Uh, if not, then you should. It's a good movie. Uh, it's a very violent movie, but there are some great management lessons and leadership lessons in that uh, that movie. Uh, this is a this is a uh, screen grab from that movie, uh, and this story is about uh, the uh, the king Leonidas in ancient Greece, uh, and uh, he used to be the king of he was a warrior king. He was the king of a city state called Sparta, and they were really warriors, as as I said, right. Uh, and they were really tiny. So when the Persian army, which was really powerful and onerous, and they just came marching and they wanted to kind of get to Sparta, these guys kind of foot to the nail, right? And they kind of gave them a black eye um, in a big, big way. So this is the story of 300. Is that a story? You should, you should uh, kind of uh, see that. But that's also a story of resilience, right? Now, resilience, uh, as I said, that it can be learned, uh, and this is uh, one of the one of the dialogues that I just put it as a as a comment here, uh, where Leonidas, Leonidas says to someone in the team that when soldiers have time to talk, their talk turns into fear because they are too tiny. They are three hundred people against a thousand against a big thousands of army of uh, Xerxes, which which is a Persian king, right? Um, so he says that action, on the other hand, produces appetite for more action, right? So act on things. I always talk about this within my team meetings and whatnot, uh, that uh, always divide things into things that you control and things you don't control. And this is not my philosophy. This is, this, there is a famous author, his name is Jonathan Haidt, uh, and he has written a book called Happiness Hypothesis. And when you focus on things that you control, you're, you are in command of that situation and you can act on them. That gives you more confidence. It's a cyclic process, right? And that's how 
kind of you develop that resilience you focus on your strengths what is good about it and uh, uh, you know you kind of uh, go back at that situation and and do what whatever the best you can do about that situation right but the thing about resilience is that resilience typically is short lived resilience is not you know a long drawn process so um uh, you know like this coronavirus hit us uh, then many people will go out there uh, and people who are amazing i mean i know because i work with so many other teams uh, from within the drupal community i know that people work from their villages and hot spots and made things happens that's amazing ownership amazing accountability seeing it through but it will only go so far but that's resilience that's accountability that's ownership but that's not scalable that's not sustainable so then comes the notion of sustainability right that how do you sustain that this is by the way the step 2 of uh, what will happen uh, ahead of this and how this will scale because it's great you know one of my engineers is working out of his village somewhere in you know deep down in uh, maharashtra uh, but th that's not how i can kind of scale this team to uh, great extent or length right so three steps really prevent prepare and predict right uh, so prevent is what is it that you can do now which is more here and now now i have written it from a company perspective but this is individual as well right so companies uh, like ourselves like acquia and treasure and excelrent and qed and others uh, we have to take uh, steps to make sure that our employees are safe their well being uh, is attended to that's like the immediate thing right uh, we are communicating effectively so on and so forth employees individuals have to make sure that they are not burnt out that they are focusing on the right things so on and so forth right but then you prepare then you uh, this is the this is the part where you are kind of preparing for you know how how do i do this you know in 6 weeks from now 8 weeks from now what else could happen thinking about the edge cases so identify priorities identify the processes that are important uh, you know kind of ruthlessly jettison things keep things which are really really important so uh, one of the things i really love is this benefit versus um versus cost or impact versus cost value versus cost kind of matrix so that gives you a very good idea in terms of what is priority what is not priority importance uh, impact kind of thing um and this this applies personally as well i mean when when so one of the things that that is happening right now uh is uh, is that we we are getting some additional time believe it or not some of us are not planning it very well um because we are not used to it uh, as individuals uh, and that i include myself in that i'm an office goer uh, if i get two additional hours uh, which were my commute hours then uh, i end up working more right but what i could do is i could take that break and i could invest it in preparing for the bigger picture right uh, and i could talk more about that but uh, there is uh, i'm i'm talking about the individual aspect of it there is a very good book called deep work where you kind of remove yourself from the noise and look at things from a distance and then kind of uh, focus on things which are really really important to you from a long tail perspective right that's what as individuals we should look at some of it will be our work related stuff some of it will be our familial priorities or our environmental things right so that kind of attitude in terms of prepare preparation and what not and then uh, predicting something that what is it the you know the long long view and some kind of prognosis view right so that's the three step view you take now again what you see in this next slide this is a tad bit boring but you don't have to uh, put your efforts into reading this i'll i'll speak to it and make you understand what this is so i talked about sustainability uh, but again this is not out of like thin air i'm not talking about this as my ideas or something right um, you, the two gents you see on the bottom left uh, the first one is michael porter michael porter is a giant in management uh, he's a harvard business school professor uh, i mean he's one of the most impactful people in the last 30 years after peter drucker and a couple of others i guess uh, philip kotler uh, michael porter is one of those names right so michael porter and it might or might not resonate with everybody in this audience but michael porter created a a theory for competitive advantage for firms um and it's i think it's called the three generic strategies or something like that and what is what it's really about is three things it's about uh, it's about uh, how can companies operations that we work for optimize cost how can we differentiate in products and how can we be more market focused 
three things, right? So three generic strategies is what it's called. It typically works very well, but in this kind of black swan scenario, it doesn't because there is no predictability around the market, right? I don't know what my sales will look like in eight months from now, right? I mean, uh, I, would, I would want to say that I do, uh, but I, I mean, nobody can say it with confidence. We have models and everything, but we don't know how this black swan event is going to pan out and what impact it will or it will not have, right? So what happened is that in 1997, uh, another professor from uh, Berkeley Haas School of Business, his name is David Tees, and a couple of his associates, he came up with this theory. It's called the dynamic capability theory. And this is something that can drive sustainability. So we came from resilience, very individual view of the world, to sustainability and how organizations sustain. And this idea is really powerful. It's about building that dynamic view of the world where you can recalibrate, reorient, adapt, and reconfigure how you look at triggers from the outside. Whether it's about your positions, it's about your processes, it's about the motions or paths you have taken, you can recalibrate, right? So different theory from uh, Michael Porter's, which is the conventional theory, which is just about markets, products, cost. This is about reorienting everything really, really quickly. For us engineers in this room, it resonates because in agile development, that's how we operate, right? We uh, execute in the smaller sprints, we get quick feedback, we kind of maintain and prioritize the backlog like that, and it's very dynamic in terms of how it pans out, right? So this is a model, a very proven model in terms of how companies could recalibrate. Now, this could mean many things. This could mean that com companies will have to redefine the complete processes in terms of how they communicate with employees, how they operate with customers, how they uh, work with supply chains, companies like Big Basket, um, Grofers, so on and so forth, and many others, right? This, could, this is the whole value chain gamut, right? It's not easy to do. The, big you, the bigger you get, the more difficult it is. So that's how you drive sustainability. And you can think about this from your own vantage point as well, right? If you are kind of set in stone in terms of how you operate, how you think, how you process, and that is limiting you, then your, your foresight, your outlook from here and forward could be dynamic, right? That does not mean that you try to double with everything, you know, like 10,000 technologies out there. And so, so if you're a Drupal guy, say, let me do a little bit of React and a little bit of Redux and a little bit of Vue.js. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you could develop that intelligence foresight, say, you know what, I, I have to have a framework where I can adapt quickly in terms of what the market or the environment demands, right? So that's the sustainability view. That's the sustainability mechanism, how companies need to recalibrate and how they'll bounce back after individual resilience, supported by individual resilience, right? Um, the other thing I'll, uh, I, I touched upon there is leadership, right? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, your leadership is really tested in times like these. Um, over here on, on, this, uh, on this screen, I have this picture of this handsome guy. Um, he, his name is Eugene Kranz. Who is this guy? He, Eugene Kranz, and by the way, he's a very old guy now. This is an old picture. This is the 70s. Um, Eugene Kranz, or Gene Kranz, um, was the flight director uh, or the mission in charge, mission control in charge, uh, for Apollo 13 operation. What was Apollo 13 operation? So um, in 1962, uh, uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, uh, expressed in in a in a in some kind of a exhortation uh, that uh, they have to go to moon. Uh, there were multiple missions that uh, were kind of that, that were woven around that. And uh, in 1969, Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong, as you know, and I forget the name of the other guy, they landed on the moon. Now, they kept, NASA kept on improving that. And then there was Apollo 12. And then there was Apollo 13. This guy was the uh, flight director, the mission control in charge for Apollo 13. Uh, the idea was to make uh, the landings on Apollo, on the moon more accurate, more precise, right? Because as you know, that that's how you improve. It's like 
iterative process, right? So it's not just that they had landed in 69 and, and it all kind of worked out. <clears throat> so uh, it had not landed on moon. It, it was, um, I, I think it was, yeah, I think 11th April, 1970 uh, or some, somewhere around that time, sometime around 1970, uh, the vessel did not land on moon and there was an explosion in uh, one of the modules uh, of, uh, of that vessel, uh, Apollo 13. And now began the exercise of how to bring the, the three astronauts which were on board safely to, uh, to Earth. Because the idea was that you know, they'll come back to Earth, right? Like Neil Armstrong did. Um, and it was a really onerous thing and very overwhelming thing. Uh, because you know, at that point, you can imagine that you know, technology would have its limitations. Um, we are talking 70s. Um, so even the, the, you know, the upper uh, quartiles of the leadership in NASA, they were very, very worried about this whole situation. So much so that uh, someone even gave the statement that this could be the worst uh, optics for NASA you know, in the public eye. Uh, this could be the worst thing that could ever happen. To which this guy, Gene Kranz, said that, uh, and this is leadership, right? And I'll explain what I mean by that. To which Gene said that actually this could be our finest hour. Now you'll say that's stupid. That was actually a difficult time. Yes, that was a difficult time. Leadership is about having a vision in difficult times. You need leadership like that. You, and vision, by the way, it's not just some surreal, dreamy, poet-like vision. It's a vision which is supported by a tactical plan, right? Um, and that's what this guy did. The, the vessel was um, 40 miles off course in terms of um, uh, its, uh, its uh, revolution around moon's orbit. One of, uh, one of the modules had an explosion um, and uh, the, the module that could come back on Earth that could only accommodate two people. So there was oxygen scarcity and whatnot. This guy, without going into the detail, uh, this guy, on the fly, this is like just in time thinking, right? Just in time compiling, just in time thinking. So right now we need just in time leadership. That's what we need, right? Um, and this guy, together with his team, made it possible for those three guys to land in uh, on Earth. Uh, I think they they only got them about seven days from the point they landed because they landed in the in the South Pacific Sea somewhere, uh, but. Uh, but the attitude that you need here is that you have to have a vision in the time of crisis. And one of the most famous things, and you should look up Gene Kranz, which is famous about Gene Kranz, is that uh, no is not an option, in what it is what he used to say. He was the first guy who came up with that, and then it became very popular in the management quarters, that no is not an option, right? That is the leadership that we need right now. That is the navigability that we need right now. And uh, that is what, and by the way, just to be clear, uh, I'm saying leadership. I'm not saying management, right? So I'm not saying that your manager should exhibit this leadership. I'm not saying that your CEO should exhibit this leadership. Leadership is without titles. Every one of us, each one of us exhibit leadership. You are exhibiting leadership already. You're wading through this difficult time for your family, for your work. This is already leadership. I am giving you a kind of a framework to think in terms of how real leaders fight uh, and kind of stand up in the face of the crisis, right? So that's the leadership part. Um, now, with all that said, um, at the end of it, uh, what is the brass text here? What is, you know, what, is, what does it all boil down to? And <clears throat> I, I don't know if you can see the, the animation on the, this image, uh, or I don't know if it's loading for you guys, but there, there is like a football team trying to hit a goal. Uh, can you guys see it, uh, Parth and all? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, cool. Um, so, so what I'm going to argue um, here is that at the end of this, the core to sustainability and for us to bounce off of this situation or any situation in a, in a uh, work setting is this foundational element of teams. And... Um, you have to understand how teams are different than groups. Teams are not a couple of guys together, right? Teams are coordinated. That's why you, you have this graphic, right? 
each one of them is so coordinated. Each one of them knows what is it that he's going to get and who he has, he or, and in this case, a he, he has to pass to and how they, what is the strategy going forward? They're well coordinated, right? They're dependent on each other. They are dovetailed, right? And they deliver, they're working towards a common goal, which is actually literally the goal here, right? That's a team. That's the definition of a team. Uh, now teams, considering that now uh, the way Conventional HR guys would, would look at teams. There will be a lot of physicality to the idea of teams, which is togetherness um, and you know just kind of touch and feel and palpability. Uh, some of those ideas uh, very easily and very quickly go out of the window in, in this conversation of teams, right? Uh, because now we are uh, we are all uh, virtual at least now, and we don't know uh, what the future holds. But looks like that this is there to stay, right? Um, so uh, th there is an interesting uh, example I will give you here. Um, uh, in, in basketball, um, there is a KSA metric that a basketball coach typically would develop, right? KSA uh, metrics is, uh, K, K is knowledge, S is skills, A is abilities, right? Uh, for every individual uh, player, in the basket. Now this is football. The, so don't get confused. I'm giving a basketball example, but this could apply to football. Um, so he would know exactly that uh, which player has what knowledge, what skill sets and what abilities, right? At an individual level, then zoom it out a little bit. He would know exactly that what are the knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge aspects or skills aspects or ability aspect that this team has at a team level because it averages out, right? There could be some rock stars, some average performers, some are, you know, right out of the college, very green guys, all of that combined average out, right? Uh, what does that look like? And at the end of the day, it, it's this whole modeling of KSAs and the connectedness from, you know, individuals to teams, to managers, to coach, is what will keep us together. So it's more foundational than this whole noise about, you know, should I use that uh, video conferencing tool or um, should we do this for screen share? It's more foundational than that, right? Teams will, which will have the right kind of dovetailing around these KSAs, right? Between teams, between individuals, between managers, they will always succeed. They will succeed on spreadsheets. I mean, of course, there will be there will be inefficiencies. I'm not denying that. So there is operational inefficiency improvements that that do happen. But the core to sustainability is teams, how well they are tethered together. So the challenge is, how do we build efficacy and efficiency within our teams? What is the best way to develop that? Right. That is the question that all of us got to ask ourselves. And. <laughs> With that context, uh, and I'm still talking about teams, uh, this is another very interesting model uh, by, um, uh, so this was a book, uh, I think it was called The Team Effectiveness or something by two guys, Cohen and Bailey. And what you see here is that they define, and this is 1997, uh, they define that these are the core components and how the information flows in a good team's construction. So indulge with me here for a moment. So task design, right? Like look at task design. So they look at things like autonomy. Is there autonomy? Is there interdependence? What is the composition? What is the tenure of people? What is the context reward supervision? That's the task design aspects that you account for. And then uh, it, it kind of dovetails to internal processes. Do you have processes for conflict resolution? Do you have processes for communication? Like. Um, I'm sure many companies do this here, but um, I, I'll give my example. So we, we are globally distributed, right? So there, there is an engagement manager sitting somewhere stateside and there is a project manager sitting here. There is a TA there. There is a TA here. There are developers here. They, then we are working with some partners. There are developers there. There is a PM there, TA there. Do you have processes, systems, to be able to manage all that and that drives your effectiveness. How do you measure that effectiveness? How do you measure performance outcomes, attitudinal outcomes, behavioral outcomes, then psychological traits, the group psychological traits, right? So how, how and this is also, a, by the way, a maturity model, right? You, you know about the norming, forming, storming kind of thing. So this also grows over time, right? Um, 
So uh, what are some of the norms, right? What are the things like, what do you discuss in standups versus what you do not discuss, right? Uh, what are the things that you flag to who and why, right? Uh, what is your shared model? Is there a shared model? I always talk about this notion of a shared purpose, by the way. If you don't have a shared purpose, uh, not everybody works towards it. And everybody in a system like this that right now we are in, you have to have a shared purpose because you cannot breathe down people's throat. What you have to do is that make sure that everybody understands it and you as a manager, as a leader, as a team lead, as an architect, have to break it down to that degree that the last guy in the food chain gets it, that this is my shared purpose, this is our shared purpose. Then it will drive itself, it will become kind of an autopilot thing, right? And then environmental factors. That's how teams work together, right? That this, is, this model, if you look at closely, it has two aspects. It has organizational aspects, and it has technological aspects. And this is the broader argument I'm making here, right? So it's very, I mean, we get lost into uh, this illusion that technology will be some sort of panacea. So a Zoom will solve it. Tomorrow, something else will come and that will solve it for us. That's not how it is. Uh, I, I think about uh, this example, and this, this is perhaps a, a slight digression, but um, th there was a time I, I used to be, a consultant for American Express, and we used to uh, implement uh, marketing automation systems and content management systems uh, like Drupal. And uh, in, in this case, at that point, there was a very famous marketing automation tool, and we would go there, and they had already bought it. We would go there, and we, we realized that, that they, are, they are not able to use that tool at all, and they're using it really, really badly. And uh, there are teams... Um, contrasting it with that, that argument. There were teams who were doing a better job with um, spreadsheets and sending emails through very cheap uh, mail, mailing systems. And they had like some, one of the most expensive marketing automation platforms and they could not use it, right? So it's not the tool. It's not always the technology that's the answer. Part of it is organization. Like autonomy and inter interdependence. This is not a technological thing, right? Communication, you can use Zoom or Teams or something else to communicate, but then still you have to have a communication model, right? What type of issues do you flag to who? Do you track defects? Do you, do you track defect removal efficiency? If you track it, why do you track it? So on and so forth, right? So you have to map this, right? This is Cohen and Bailey's model that this is what good teams look like. That's how they kind of operate optimally. And you have to divide it and see, okay, what part of these components or these boxes are technological problems? And now think back in terms of the new normal. If you understand these boxes, then you will know, okay, this is a gap. Now I see a gap, right? This is what good looks like. And we don't have a, this, is, this looks like a technological problem. And I think I need to get, go get something for this. I have a collaboration problem here. But then there, there could be things like, which are very organizational, right? And it's now more than ever before that we need those organizational processes to be solved for as well. Okay, so I'm with 40 minutes, I'm almost uh, nearing the end of my case here. And uh, this is the last slide and I'll open it up for questions. Uh, as I was told that I have to wrap it up within 45 minutes. Um, so I will. Uh, so uh, this is a quote from Zinov. And I think this is what I want to leave you with. I don't want to tell you or prescribe you that this is exactly what technology and digital transformation um, use cases look like, because to be honest, I don't know. And I don't think anybody knows. We are all speculating. But one thing which is, which is true is the overarching paradigm that is shifting, right? So, so far it was about cost saving. It was about productivity. How do you become more efficient? It was about customer experience. And now it's about business continuity, right? Um, there, there's, the best of the businesses out there uh, who are killing it, I cannot name those businesses. Uh, uh, and, you know, they had to be shut down um, completely. Uh, so we have to think about business continuity. We individually have to think about continuity, right? And this is the idea of continuity uh, that will drive us forward and technology can be a great enabler for that. So with that, uh, I think I will... I will pause and see if there are any questions. I could take them. Of course, you can reach out to me. There's my email address on the slide right here. So if you have any further questions, but if you have any questions right now, I'll take them. So uh, there's a question around, uh, you know, 
uh, personal growth. So I'll just read that out for you and maybe you can answer this uh, to the crowd. What are your thoughts on the personal growth? Uh, and personal growth is in quotes. Uh, how it fits into the shared model you shared, uh, which covers technology and organizational growth. So I think uh, it's more about how does personal growth of an individual fit into uh, the grand scheme of things? Uh, I hope I've gone, you know. Yeah, sure. So, sure. So, um, yeah, so I'll, 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 take a, I'll take a shot at that. So I think, um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a broader point there and then I'll, I'll extrapolate it to this shared model that I talked about um, that your question alludes, alludes to. Um, in, in terms of uh, the broader point, um, I, I think this, one of the problems that we have, and I'm, I'm not broad brushing, I'm, I'm including myself in that, that we need instant dopamine hits. Uh, what, I, what I mean by that, we, are, we live in the generation of uh, you know, Facebook, and LinkedIn, we post something, we, we want to know, okay, how many people like my photograph that gives us a kick, right? And we go back, keep going back there. That's a, there is a, there is a play. That's how these product designers design it. But these are instant dopamine hits and they are not necessarily good, right? So one of the, one of the analogies I give is that the, the times that we live in, we want to get the feeling of being at the top of Mount Everest, but we don't want to put the effort of climbing Mount Everest. And that is a huge gap, right? Because short circuiting never works. I mean, our elders used to say it, but that's not untrue, right? Um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell uh, writes about this, this beautiful principle called the 10,000 hours rule, right? That if you want to be good at anything, uh, you spend 10,000 hours doing it. If you want to be a great basketball player, spend 10,000 hours doing it. Uh, if you want to be a great uh, engineer, spend 10,000 hours doing it, right? I, one of the problems I call out to my engineers and my team is that engineers these days have this problem. I call it the new shiny object syndrome. So there is a new technology that comes out there. A good example is let's say React came out, right? I'm a Drupal guy. I'm a backend Drupal guy. And this guy is like hearing React everything and talking about how, you know, state management is done in Redux and all that stuff, right? And this guy is really excited about it. What he did, he defocused from Drupal uh, which is putting, uh, you know, uh, bread and uh, butter to the table uh, and focused on something which is the new shiny object, React. Not saying React is bad, not saying that. What I'm saying is that there are people who might be doing React for a much longer time, 10,000 hours. You will be spending like one week, one month, one year. You will always be in this constant catch up. So either you pivot completely and make it the long 10,000 hour game or you'll always keep, toe dipping into one thing or another. So to answer your broader question, which is that career growth, career growth has to be a long-term thing. We cannot be short-sighted. We cannot be dependent on small dopamine hits, right? That, okay, let me learn this. Let me do this quick POC. Oh, now I know this thing. Now I know how to work with components. Now I know document object model manipulation and virtual DOMs and React. That's not what it is. It's academic. You are fooling yourself. You're giving yourself a wrong narrative, right? You have to put the sweat. You have to you have to uh, climb that Mount Everest and that get that feeling. That is why uh, someone wrote WhatsApp in our language, which was like a dated thing, right? Um, th that is why uh, Object C, which was dead way back, uh, someone um, kind of uh, came back when it, when again, that's, there's a long story. I think someone, I think Vidhatanan shared that video um, and that was a great video. I, I learned about that, uh, that, that how that got resurrected by Apple acquiring those engineers who were Object C guys. Otherwise, Object C would have been dead way, way early. But what I'm saying is that persevere. Do not fall into this trap of quick incentives and do not do toe dipping. Do something for long enough to become valuable. That's the broader point. Shared model, I think the way you have to think about this is that what is it that is valuable to you? What is it that is valuable to your organization? And what is it that you really love, right? Uh, the intersection of that is the sweet spot, right? So if you're working for Rahul's team or uh, Ankur's team, there, there, is a lot of, um, there is a lot of skin in the game that they have around your success, right? So uh, you identify that overlap and you invest your energies in that sweet spot. And that is the shared model aspect of it. Because this, this team, I'm, to be honest, I don't come from an open source world. I've been uh, in the you know, in the closed source 
um, world of uh, technology implementation. And this is this is huge for me. The five years ago when I got into this world, I, I did not even realize the type of wisdom and uh, you know the type of uh, collective sharing and you know being here for the community type of philosophy and how powerful it is. Um, so I think you you guys are have something amazing on your hands, and that is how the shared model kind of connects with that. But that's the broader point. I mean, don't fall for these you know new shiny objects short term. Does that? I hope that answers whoever's question was that. Yeah, it was an anonymous attendee. Uh, so in case uh, it does not, please feel free to ask a follow-up question. Uh, we do have two more questions. Oh, actually, three more questions right now. Uh, but we'll take uh, Ankur's first uh, because it was first in line. So uh, Ankur asks that, uh, you know, what is your, you know, advice on continuity uh, to Drupal businesses uh, in, you know, Drupal business community of India? Uh, I think that's a great question, and uh, it's a it's a little paradoxical. Ankur is asking it. I think Ankur Ankur kind of uh, nailed this model, um, but I, I'll I'll try and answer that any any which way. Um, uh, so I, I think um, for me, for Drupal community or any organization, it's about value creation, right? As uh, I think Rahul said that when Dipain pointed out, and I, I did not know about this, I just learned about it, that Dipain pointed out about the quality of her contributions, right? So it's very easy to kind of fool ourselves uh, with the narrative that we are, you know, one of the top contributors. But uh, this devil's advocate thing where we say, you know what, the quality is not there, we need to improve on that. Someone needs to play that, right? Someone needs to continuously work towards value creation. Um, and not just live with the illusion of value creation because th this is the danger that all of us live in right my i mean one of my teachers when i was growing up used to say that if you live with a lie for too long you almost start believing that is the truth and that's the trap here right that if we start telling ourselves oh i'm a great drupal guy i'm you know we we, we are the best drupal team in the world and we might not be there if if at all we are not i'm not saying you know some of some of you might be, but I'm saying if we are not, then that's a narrative, that's a booby trap that we fall into. Uh, so it's about, it boils down to value creation. Ankur's team does a great job. We partner and we work uh, very well together. And I think um, uh, just seeing it through uh, is perhaps what um, I, I will think about uh, continuity because uh, I think that is how you, that is how you get through this uh, this trough that we are all in. I don't know if that answers Ankur's question, but that's what I would say. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, we have two more questions, uh, and then we'll sure. wrap it up. Uh, in so, uh, one question from Mansi Vora uh, is around uh, you know e-commerce. So she asks, uh, you know, we see online retail as the new normal. How do you see Drupal slash Acquia driving e-commerce in the new post-COVID world? Is there a strategy or something? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, Mansi. Thanks for asking that. Um, I I do see that there will be a lot of disruption uh, into how uh, how physical retail works. Um, I I don't think I know enough to be able to write it off completely, right? Because uh, th there is a lot of psychosocial aspects to it. You know, as I said, you know, I mean. Uh, the uh, the earliest of literature you read about uh, human race it's about physicality uh, and that is something that at least so far we have not cracked with the whole digital transformation narrative and i know huge companies i mean the world i came from to acquia uh, we were we were doing implementations for procter and gamble um, uh, and that was huge but i i don't see that we have we have created something as good as the physical palpability of uh, a physical retail store, right? Um, so this is this is something that has spooked people. This is a big disruptor, and we are already seeing an uptick. Uh, and I think for engineers in in the web world uh, and companies in the Drupal space, uh, it could be an opportunity. Um, to be honest, but I don't know what to make of it, and I, I don't know if uh, this is exactly how it will pan out. It, it, the answer might be somewhere in the middle. It, it could be that the definition of physical will also change a bit, but physical, will it disappear from the face of the earth? 
I, I don't know, but there is certainly an uptick and I think we are already seeing it. I'm sure others are seeing it too. Um, so that's what I'll say about that point. Okay. So, uh, I mean, in short, if do you see Acme and Drupal, uh, you know, driving it uh, in a specific manner, like taking, uh, you know, more initiatives around that? Is there is there a plan or something like that? That's, I think, the question. So, yeah, so, uh, so Acme and Drupal, I mean, again, um, yeah. Acquia, I can speak for Acquia. I think yeah. we have an integration view of commerce. Uh, Drupal has a commerce view, which I'm sure some of the other speakers here, Gabor is coming next. He might be more equipped to talk about, or some others might be more equipped to talk about what would be the commerce take of uh, Drupal. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I'm sure that if, if, if a business case emerges uh, like that, then uh, Drupal and Acquia both would uh, tap on, onto it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for that as well. Uh, we have one more question uh, from Bharat Ahuja. Uh, the question is broad around, uh, you know, uh, not specific to just Drupal ecosystem, but uh, more around how, you know, the technology ecosystem keeps on evolving and changing on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. His question uh, is around how do we train ourselves or our children to become adaptive so as to enable <laughs> us or them uh, and handle slash learn. I like how you know this person has put it. Handle slash learn any technology, whatever it may be, uh, because sometimes you have to just handle it and not necessarily learn. Is that the, I don't. Know. But what would be your advice here? Yeah. So, um, so I'm just trying to get a hang of this uh, question. Uh, he's he's saying that the languages are evolving with technology, right? And so, how yeah. do we? How do you make them adapt, our children, mm -hmm. next generation? Yeah. yeah, basically, how 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 do people, you know, make themselves adaptive and um, more agile in that sense? So, so Bharat was uh, Bharat is a part of uh, Acquia. Now he's moved to uh, stateside, and Bharat and I had this conversation. I'll answer it uh, for sure. Um, uh, so, my philosophy here is uh, very straightforward. Uh, I I think um, the foundations don't change. Right. Uh, what I mean by that, if there was a guy who uh, 20 years ago, who was a great C++ programmer, 15 years ago, a great C++ programmer and uh, one of the best programmers out there, uh, even if that person has to learn a new syntax in 2025, that guy won't be a bad programmer. It's about foundations. Right. So I don't think your foundations change. I do think that. There is a lot of um, a lot of self projection that uh, many engineering cohorts have around development of new uh, new languages and so on and so forth. Some are great, but some perhaps are unnecessary. I I'm saying it with a, <laughs> a lot of control to this group. Uh, but but that said, that if if there is there is something that comes to the fore, which is really something that most people should embrace. Um, I think uh, someone who's good in good in foundations uh, would embrace it. So uh, to your broader point, Bharat, about how to make our children adaptive, uh, I think tr teach them foundations, right? T teach them stuff uh, around logical thinking, tre teach them analytical thinking, teach them lateral thinking. Do not worry about how that syntax looks in PHP versus React versus Golang. Don't worry about that because uh, that is syntax. You know, um, an excellent .NET programmer will not be a very poor PHP programmer with some training. Is what my philosophy. Is. So don't get you know kind of uh, blocked by uh, that narrative that languages keep changing. Focus on algorithms. Focus on foundations. Focus on the fundamental uh, building blocks. And I think we should be good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we have one more question in chat, but you know, uh, since in, in interest of time, uh, I just uh, I just suggest that you know we take that question later on, Dipen. Uh, in So his question sure. around in, in con so uh, since we only have two more minutes to the next uh, presentation, uh, that is by Gabor. Uh, you know, I you know I'd like to thank you at this point mukesh uh, for presenting the keynote session here uh, really uh, enjoyed it uh, and uh, yeah if you have any closing words uh, uh, i'll then pass on to uh, you know myself again to uh, take a break a so thank thank you prath my closing words are that thank you so much and thank you for this opportunity i think this is a great initiative uh, that you guys are uh, putting together. I, I'm, I'm, I was uh, 
talking to a few people within people within Acquia, I think there is a lot of reception and a lot of recognition around the efforts that you guys have put in. So I'm I'm really I, I feel really privileged that you I got an opportunity to speak to this uh, this cohort, this group. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, acknowledge and thank you so much uh, for those kind words. Of